see what the context for it is. But my point this morning is this. You can take a verse of the Scripture and you can learn from it. You can know what the general teaching of that Scripture is. But it's good to know the context. Another way to study the Scripture is when you've found something in the Bible, to look throughout the Scripture and say, is this taught anywhere else? Because when that happens, what you'll do is you'll learn additional material about the same thing. Of course, it's great to study all four of the Gospels. Recently, we just went through the book of John. And it's the Gospel, uh, the good news about who Jesus was and what people did with Jesus. And that's the Gospel according to John. With, Of course, we understand that it was through the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit that the book of John was written. But if you want another perspective on the Gospel, the, the good news about who Jesus is and what people did with Jesus, you won't find a different Gospel in Matthew, but you'll find a different perspective. And you can read the Gospel of Mark, and you'll find a different perspective. And you read the Gospel of Luke, and you'll find a more detailed perspective. And each of them would add a perspective of the same truth. And that is true in the Scripture, not just with the Gospels, but about Bible truth. You see, my friend, truth is unchanging. Truth is unchanging. What is true today has been true always and will be true always. Truth is not changing. You know, a lot of people say, well, truth is relative. What do they mean by that? What do they mean? A thing is relative to what it's related to. A truth is relative to what, in other words, gravity is relative to people who live within the realm of its influence. If you go into outer space, gravity is not relative. Do you understand what I'm saying? But gravity, my friend, exists always in whether or not it's relative to you. And so a lot of people would say, they would make the argument that truth, is, truth does change relative to your environment or your circumstances. My friend, truth has application relative to your environment or circumstance. In other words, if the Bible says, Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, my friend, if you're not trying to lie or bear false witness, it doesn't have application. Well, my friend, it's a truth. You understand what I'm saying? Thou shalt not murder. Well, if you're not trying to murder somebody, that law perhaps does not have application to you, but my friend, it does not make it an unreal or untrue fact or law. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's wrong to murder whether or not you feel like it or not. If you feel like it and that law restrains you from that which God says is against His holy nature, then my friend, it's relative to you. But truths being relative has nothing to do with it being true or untrue. Do you understand that? It's a fallacious, by that it means false. I like to use words like fallacious. Now you know what it means, I can use it without telling you what it means, right? You already knew that, but just in case. It's a fallacious argument or a false argument that because something is not relevant, then it's not true. You understand what I'm saying? Relative means it has direct application to yourself. My friend, gravity is true whether or not it has application to you. I would far rather jump out of something without a parachute in outer space than on Earth because of gravity's relativity here. But I want oxygen if I'm in outer space because that will be relative there. Do you see what I'm saying? See, oxygen is relative to people no matter where they are. And yet it just makes a difference on your circumstances, but truth is truth. And people put out the stupidest arguments to try to disprove God or disprove spiritual truth or application. And, they, and the argument in the church, in the what century are we in? Is this the 21st century? In the 21st century, those century things always confuse me. We were in the 1900s, and we were talking 20th, you know, this is the 20th century. This, we're, not, we're not in the 20th century, this is the 1900s confuses me. Well, now we're in the 21st century, and it's not even 2100 yet, but I, I understand how that works. You don't have to explain it to me afterward. It, it just confuses me anyway. So, uh, we're in the 21st century, and a lot of people say, well, you know what? You know what? We need to make the Bible relevant. We need to make sure, you know, Pastor, you've got to understand the day and age in which we live. My friend, I have to say to you, that is the most foolish argument to not do things the Bible way that has ever been invented in the mind of man. That is ridiculous. You know, Pastor, in the church now, uh, people are entertainment-minded in this day and age. And that's true, isn't it? Listen, I will tell you something. If I don't illustrate or if I don't try to be interesting... As I preach, if I just laid out Bible fact, people would say, well, that's kind of dry, dull, and boring. That's not what we want. We want I understand that you can use tools to help. 
But my friend, church isn't about entertaining. And just because we live in an entertainment day and age doesn't mean that we don't need to know the truth of the Scripture. We don't need solid Bible preaching and teaching. And the people always try to make everything relative to the day and wage we in which we live instead of making it relative to God and His Word. I said a whole bunch there. Now let's make a couple points. Let me just tell you right up front, before we even read our text and ask the Lord's help in prayer, what we're going to talk about. We're in a series on, uh, in, on Sunday mornings we're going to be preaching about having the power of God in your life. And on Sunday evenings we're going to be talking about prayer and getting answer to prayer. Those are the things we're going to be, uh, for about a month or so, that we're going to be preaching on. And so I want... This morning, though, we're going to look at what the Scripture says about having God's supernatural power in your life. And our premise this morning is that God fully intends for every person in today's day and age to have His supernatural power in their life. Can I rephrase that in a way that's more personal? You are intended by God to have His supernatural power in your life. You are intended by God to have His supernatural power in your life today. Let's read our text. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, this is speaking of the individuals to whom Peter has just preached the gospel, and by the way, a condemning gospel. Uh, when Peter preached the gospel, he condemned everybody. He said, you have rejected Jesus, and the results of your rejecting Jesus is that you've crucified Christ. He was the prophesied Messiah, and now you had better repent from it, or you will spend a godless eternity, separated eternally from God in hell. And so he's preached a very, very, uh, very, I guess, powerful sermon, but not just powerful, very poignant to these individuals who are unbelievers, and but who are are uh, spiritually concerned. Verse 37, the result of it was this. Well, let me read verse 36. He said, Therefore, as a conclusion of the sermon, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the conclusion of his sermon was, you killed Jesus, and God made him Lord in Christ. He's alive, he's in heaven, and he's not dead but you tried to kill Him. In other words, the indictment is, you crucified Christ and you're guilty for His death. Well, that's a pretty, <laughs> a pretty strong statement, isn't it? Now, here's the conclusion. Now, when they heard this, verse 37, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And so, they're referring to, they're, they're trying to be a, a part of a group that didn't kill Jesus, which would have been Peter and his disciples, and so they address himself as brethren. What do we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Let's ask the Lord's help now, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer this morning, it is our desire that you would privilege us by speaking to our hearts from your word. Father, I ask that this morning that you would help us to lay aside distractions and say that this message today is personal and that it's intended for us. And God, may today we be convinced from the scripture that you intend for each and every one of us to be fully empowered by your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would do that in our midst today, that you would convince us of this Bible truth, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, uh, let me, before we begin, just kind of pick up just a little bit uh, in mentioning to you where we're at. We have looked at so far in our study on the Holy Spirit of God at the fact that Jesus promised that when He was to go into heaven, He was to leave His people on earth, that they would not be without a comforter. They would not be comfortless. His promise to His disciples, His followers, and to the future believers. Do you remember the prayer that Jesus prayed? Not just for His disciples, but for them who will believe, was that they would be kept. That they would be kept by God. And then in John chapter 14, He makes this astounding promise that I'm not going to leave you comfortless. 